I'm going to tell you about two things that happened to me today. <laughs> uh, the first thing is I went to get out of bed today at my lovely workout and uh, struggled. Um, so my back is a little sore, so I'm going to be sort of hunched over here a little bit. Um, the second thing is I'm going to get my shirt in on the cab. So it's been a pretty good day so far. Um, so my name is Justin Bingham. I'm the Director of Business Development at Synthetic Genomics. Um, I originally, we had put this title in Next Steps in Cell Engineering as a placeholder. Um, uh, what I think I'll do is I'll change the title name to, if I can figure out how to work it. Uh, John and Leaves in Cell Engineering. Uh, so, synthetic genomics is uh, constantly improving its cell engineering techniques through um, bioinformatics analysis and um, DNA synthesis, as well as uh, interesting things like genome um, transplantation and other things that I'll cover in this slide. Yeah. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know who synthetic genomics is, who we are, and what we do, uh, the company was founded by the two gentlemen in the in the upper uh, right hand corner there. Um, you probably need no introduction. Dr. Craig Venter, uh, founder of Human Genome Sciences, Diversity Corporation, and Solera Genomics, and most recently the founder of um, a company called Human Longevity Incorporated, focused on deep human sequencing and microbiome sequencing. Uh, he was the recipient of the 2008 National Medal of Science for his work in that sequencing. Uh, Dr. Ham Smith is uh, the Scientific Director of Synthetic Biology at the JCBI. Uh, he was the recipient of the 1978 Nobel Prize um, in Medicine for his work in type 2 restriction enzymes. The company was founded back in 2005. We're located out in La Jolla, California. Um, we have three sites now, all within about 200 meters of each other. Um, it's a private health company, and we're actually up to about 210 employees um, working in La Jolla. Um, so what do we do? What do we do? So uh, SGI offers you high value solutions um, in cell engineering. Uh, we have viral engineering platforms to engineer viruses for detection of vaccines um, and the construction of synthetic bacteriophages for antimicrobials. Uh, we have protein engineering capabilities to design, optimize, and synthesize proteins, vaccines, antigens, and antibody therapeutics. Uh, we also have a vaccines platform um, and then uh, last but not least is a um, tools and technologies group called SGI DNA that's focused on commercializing and kidding really all of the different technologies that come out of the SGI core. Uh, SGI DNA has a table out in the back uh, in the uh, showroom out there and is a primary sponsor of the event. Okay, so genome engineering. Um, so we're uh, slowly but surely developing the capacity to design and build synthetic organisms uh, at Synthetic Genomics. We do this on demand in an automated fashion. So we leverage um, bioinformatics capabilities, a high throughput DNA synthesis pipeline, and some of the, the different uh, cell engineering uh, tactics that were discussed at the conference today um, to, to create new organisms. Um, most of our genome design is guided by knowledge of minimal gene sets and gene orders. So we have a vast database of organisms that we've sequenced, and we also tap into public databases. Uh, we develop minimal cells as chassis for building more complex uh, cells with program characteristics. So Craig has talked a lot about uh, his attempt to create or synthesize the minimal genome, which is basically the core set of genes that are responsible for um, the replication of life. Um, we have sophisticated DNA design software that's enabling us to um, the capacity to build and test all of these organisms that we build de novo. And uh, we're now crossing over from the microbial world or prokaryotic world into eukaryotic systems, so we now have a few agreements in place with um, partners around uh, cell engineering and eukaryotic organisms. Okay, so... Um, we have our own uh, proprietary uh, database of annotated genomes that we've collected over the years. So Craig has been out there sequencing virtually everything he can get his hands on, buckets of seawater, uh, things from the Amazon jungle, um, things from the Mojave Desert. Um, and we've been slowly but surely assembling those uh, genomes, annotating them, and getting them into a database, um, a database um, architecture called Archetype. 
Um, it's a software that we developed internally to alleviate some of the bottlenecks associated with um, bioinformatics. So it was specifically designed to enable benchtop scientists to um, gain access to genomic data and query that data. So you can run comparative genomics, uh, transcriptomics, all sorts of different um, data analyses across a broad set of genomes. It doesn't matter where they come from. Um, on the right is an example of some of the uh, data sets that we have, um, have in archetype, and I should say that this is an old, uh, uh, kind of an outdated list, and we probably have three times as much data now in the, in the database, um, obviously including uh, one human genome, and you can guess where that came from, uh, fully annotated and accessible through archetype. Uh, we've now been working within um, primate systems, canine systems, um, and most recently, uh, the porcine genome will be will be available through Archetype. Uh, so this is something that we now offer um, as a bench seat license to end users. We also have the ability to offer um, corporate wide licenses. Um, we're looking at different models to enable uh, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies specifically um, to access our data sets, our proprietary data sets, if you'd like to go through and, and look for um, things of interest. Uh, we can also work with you to get your proprietary data into Archetype so it's accessible by, let's say, all of Merck or uh, We've also developed, um, oops, excuse me. Um, a broad set of um, DNA synthesis tools. So we are, um, I'd say, hands down the world leaders in, in uh, DNA synthesis and manipulation of DNA constructs. Uh, we're constantly um, developing and acquiring uh, new DNA uh, assembly technologies. Uh, we consider that a core attribute to the entire company. Um, so it's, it's a hyper focus of ours to continually improve how we uh, make DNA and the ability to work through complex uh, sequences. We have a uh, patented technology called the Gibson assembly method, which is a method for assembling double stranded DNA together using uh, homologous overlaps um, and a master mix formulation containing three enzymes. Um, it's probably the most widely used tool in synthetic biology um, today, and I'd say that uh, it's uh, very quickly making its way into the traditional molecular biology world. So um, traditional cloners and molecular biologists are using the Gibson assembly technology to assemble multiple genes, inserts, fragments of interest into a vector in a single reaction. Uh, so it alleviates a lot of the bottlenecks um, uh, of liquid ligation, and it's a, it's a very efficient and, and a very inexpensive uh, process. So we have reagents available around that we use the Gibson assembly. Uh, we've gone so far at SGI DNA to automate uh, the Gibson assembly technology in a high throughput uh, fashion, so we actually offer services, DNA synthesis services, um, out of SGI DNA um, that leverage the Gibson assembly process. Uh, we're also bringing instrumentation. Uh, so just recently we launched uh, the BioXP 3200, which is the first um, DNA assembly instrument of its kind in that um, it will assemble all the nucleotides into double-stranded DNA of uh, a certain length. Right now we're at about 1.8 kb um, overnight. So this would sit at your bench. Um, it's virtually hands-free, as I said. Um, it, it produces high fidelity sequences using a unique error correction technology. So, a great example of um, of uh, access to our database was that we actually went in and identified this unique error correction enzyme in our database just through um, uh, simple comparative genomics and and, and sequence identity. Um, so that's incorporated into the instrument. Um, it provides uh, users with a faster turnaround time uh, than conventional methods at a lower cost. And it's very reliable, so we have a um, very unique error correction that enables the output of the instrument to have roughly one error in every five, 4,000 to 5,000 uh, bases. Um, it also enables researchers to have better control of their workflow. I should also mention that there's a, a, an application build out of just this one piece of hardware um, that will enable uh, researchers within the next, let's say, the next six to eight months um, to go from a sequence of choice, a sequence of interest, to a clone of interest. 
So the instrument will actually produce plasmid DNA ready for uh, the next step. Uh, eventually, the instrument with the same amount of hardware, just a software upgrade, is going to um, enable you to input a sequence and have a small amount of protein come out. So uh, it's a very exciting thing. We're actually in the process of looking for early access program members. Um, so these are customers who are willing to purchase the instrument. Uh, it's a $49,000 piece of equipment, so it's not too expensive. Um, and then work with us um, to develop some of these applications and tailor them towards the pharmaceutical industry. So, uh, back to cell engineering. So we have two approaches to cell engineering. How we do it. Um, the first is really a top-down method. Um, and it's really just integrating uh, synthetic genomics tools, our tools, into a traditional uh, cell engineering process. And so obviously with us it starts with uh, next-gen sequencing. So we have a, um, a large uh, set of capabilities to sequence genomes. We have virtually every platform um, under the sun, or at least the ones that we think that are, are effective and work. Um, so that includes the pack bio systems. Uh, we have the next the next seeks, the my seeks, the high seeks, the Sanger. So we use all those tools um, in conjunction to completely sequence um, genomes and then get them into our architect database. And then once they're in our architect database, uh, we can make them accessible to our customers for analysis. Um, so we can basically give you a login to archetype. You can see the work that we're doing. We can work together on how to how to effectively uh, manipulate the genome and decide um, what needs to be edited and how. Um, once we make that decision, there's probably a set of genes or pathways that need to be synthesized. Um, that's when we leverage a high-throughput gene synthesis platform and BioSP uh, to make genes and pathways of interest. And then it moves into um, the editing portion of the, of the process where effectively we're just using this, the multiple methods for rapid genome editing that we discussed today to get things in, back into the genome. Um, and then we also have the ability to, because of the way we build our genes, to construct high throughput libraries um, so we can deliver massive amounts of variants of these engineered cells for testing. So if a company were to come, uh, you know, utilize our service in cell engineering, uh, the way it would work is uh, they would provide the platform input <coughs> to show the cell lines, um, in which a customer needs it optimized for production of a certain protein, or mo more protein, or novel protein, or what have you. 293 cells, IPS cells, you name it. Um, the output is an optimized cell line for better productivity, so whatever the, whatever the researchers are looking for. Um, and it's basically leveraging our next-gen sequencing platform to sequence that cell line, get it available in archetype, manipulate the genome de novo, synthesize the genes or pathways, and then use editing techniques to get them back into the genome. The second method, which is really the leap of the, uh, that I mentioned in the title, um, is building cells from the bottom up. So this is where we actually build genomes de novo from scratch. Um, so this was work, this came from work that was published in 2010 by Craig and Pam Smith and Dan Gibson where they constructed a 1.2 micro, uh, mycoplasma genome uh, from scratch, from oligonucleotides. And our philosophy here is still the same. It, it really relies on sequencing. So going out into nature and grab, uh, getting a hold of anything you can get, get your hands on, sequencing it, getting it into the database, understanding uh, the design elements and intricacies of what makes that genome tick, um, and then being able to produce a blueprint of the genome and a, basically a construction blueprint of how to build the genome. And then executing on the construction using DNA synthesis technologies, um, and then eventually taking that genome and transplanting it into a recipient cell to create a synthetic cell that's hopefully doing exactly what you're asking it to do. Um, so here's the, here's the ultimate bottoms up example for us. Um, it was published in 2010, as I said. Um, basically, <laughs> Craig and Ham and Dan, they built uh, this 1.2 million base pair mycoplasma genome out of oligonucleotides, um, starting with 60 MERS. They assembled them into 1 kb um, primary fragments, sequence verified them. Uh, once they had all 
um, 1,000 or so uh, sequence verified 1KB fragments that you then use the Gibson assembly to make them into second stage intermediates that were roughly um, 10 KB in length. Uh, then they used Gibson again to take those 10 KB sequence verified fragments and make them into 100 KB, and so on until they got to the 1.2 million base pair uh, fully sequenced genome. So in this situation, we have the capabilities of synthesizing DNA, assembling it into a genome, and transplanting it to a recipient cell to, to create a, a synthetic cell. So I'm just going to go through some quick uh, examples of cell engineering you know, that's going on internally that we have programs for. The first is in uh, in a relationship or a partnership that we have with United Therapeutics where we're actually going through um, it's a large-scale genome editing project to create pig organs from human, for human transplantation. So the first uh, target is the lung we're going through and uh, deep sequencing the porcine genome, identifying genes that could cause um, issues upon transplantation, knocking out or replacing those genes with human genes and creating humanized lungs. And so it's the ability to analyze, design, build, and test and this iterative cycle of improvements uh, with our partners that, that has become the, uh, the crux of the project. The second, uh, second example is really low-hanging fruit in our minds um, in, when it comes to synthetic biology, so it's, it's around uh, natural products. Um, so we all know that uh, natural products are a valuable source for um, new compounds for pharmaceutical. Um, we also know that there's been some issues in obtaining novel compounds in the last few years with the way that screening is done. And so what we're proposing is um, actually using bioinformatics to go in and isolate um, some of these natural product pathways out of, let's say, our proprietary database as an example. Uh, take those PKS pathways, <laughs> synthesize them de novo, and use um, cell engineering to insert them into um, a heterologous host, the host that we're proposing, um, and that we have a lot of experience is the Kitrid production system. Um, we've done this um, at length with uh, food, uh, high value food compounds, I'll say that. Um, I can't really go much further than that. But we propose using the same system for these novel molecules um, from PKS cryptic pathways, secondary metabolites, in a Kitrid production system. <coughs> Viral engineering. So we've also created a, an engineering platform for working with uh, bacteriophage um, uh, for human antimicrobial therapies, and our first target is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, basically, we're going in and isolating um, large libraries um, and doing massive uh, screening and bioinformatics work uh, to identify uh, genes of interest, targets of interest, and then synthesizing those targets using cell engineering to get them in phase and then creating libraries around them. I think this is the last example, um, and this is uh, probably fairly highly published at this point, but um, back in 2009, um, the, the H1N1 pandemic demonstrated a need for more rapid vaccine production, and so Synthetic Genomics and Novartis uh, joined forces <laughs> to create a new uh, synthetic influenza vaccine production platform that leverages DNA synthesis to create the H1N1 genes um, basically overnight and engineer them into um, mammalian cells to create uh, vaccine virus seeds in less than four days. And so this, um, this strategy is, is eventually going to probably replace the 35-day production time uh, using the traditional egg-based -like process for influenza. Lastly, um, I just wanted to introduce SGI DNA as a resource for the various synthetic biology tools <laughs> and technologies that we, that we use in the core. We offer them as a services. We offer them through our informatics um, archetype software. Um, we have a line of reagents now that we, um, that we have formulated and we actually make in La Jolla. Believe it or not, we uh, transformed our men's room into a for reagent manufacturing um, production facility. <laughs> um, so don't worry, they're, <laughs> they're fine. Um, but we have a, a series of, of different reagents that we are now selling um, throughout the world and we offer commercial licenses if you want to use them to um, do any sort of uh, production commercial-based applications. 
Um, and then lastly, instrumentation. We're, we're big believers that um, this instrument is going to democratize um, um, molecular biology and it's going to be the new source of DNA so that we no longer have to rely on uh, cDNA and templates and PCR amplification to obtain our fragments of interest. <coughs> and so with that, um, I'm going to, uh, to wrap up and let you know that um, Craig Venter stepped down as the CEO of Synthetic Genomics last year to go full-time with the Human Longevity Company. He's still very active. Um, he's still very active as the chairman of the board, um, but we have a new CEO in charge. His name is Oliver Fetzer, and um, he is a pharma, um, an ex-pharma CEO, and he's very focused, almost hyper-focused on um, basically pivoting all of these tools and technologies that I was talking about and figuring out a way to develop them to meet the needs of the pharmaceutical industry. So with that, he's out there looking for partnerships. Um, I'm out there uh, selling research tools to the, farmers, to the farmer market. And then we also have our service and help source And then Brian will be at the back in the, uh, at the table with you. DNA synthesis technology permit to synthesize any DNA sequence because in the past, in time, I had to order some sequence and I was told, oh, it's too complex. Yeah, we'll still say that. <laughs> but I can tell you that uh, we've, we've done some things. So we, using the Gibson assembly technology and DNA design strategies, we're able to now break up a lot of the complexities that companies normally struggle with. I can tell you that we built our, uh, the first 100% uh, GC construct, for instance. This was about 3 kb. It was all Gs and Cs. Um, we have figured out strategies to work through tandem repeats and homopolymers and palindrome sequences. Um, so I, I have some examples of some very complex constructs that we were able to build. Um, so I'd say we're, we're getting better, but uh, there, there will be some things that we still haven't done. Um, I haven't figured out how to work with it. Can your instrument take care of those things, or is this <coughs> a good custom DNA service? So the instrument uh, is not designed to handle the very complex. So right now the instrument makes up to 1.8 kb pieces. Very soon it will actually have Gibson assembly incorporated into it where it will take the 1.8 kb pieces and it'll be able to assemble those into larger pieces, let's say up to 10 or 12 kb. It'll be able to circularize them, so you can have a plasmid. Um, it can handle, uh, it does have a, a complexity uh, threshold that we work with it. Anything that doesn't work with that, within that complexity threshold, we make them all. So I have a quick question. <laughs> I just want to know where you actually have your men's room now. <laughs> it's awful. We have a cliff on the back. <laughs> now I'm the only one with the door. <laughs> I guess I can talk more outside when we uh, go to your boat, but um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the use of CRISPR tools, and, um, more specifically with iPS cells? So, do you, um, do you have experience we, with that? I, I can't, uh, I'm, I'm this correctly because I, I, I get coached by our IP attorneys. <laughs> uh, we do, and we have our own editing technologies as well. Um, in terms of IPS cells, um, so all of that work has come out of United Therapeutics, and I can sort of walk you through what we've done um, and on help them. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. And now we'll go to Jeff.